This is a lesson on great expectations. Did you read the uh, novel by Dickens? You remember Miss Haversham and her wedding gown that she was left at the altar. It was a very sad book. Now, but the good thing is, this is not a sad study. This is a smiling study. Oh, look at here. We have my, I have, no I have my handy dandy assistant. Okay, so we have the first three habits of an introduction. And you're gonna say them to me. What are they? Stop. And I know so many of you wanna say stop, look, and listen, don't you? So I crossed it out, so you would know you were wrong. No, you're not wrong. You're very right if you're crossing the street. You're, you're not quite right enough, that's a positive spin on it, if what you want to do is cross a threshold into somebody else's life. So smiling is more important than listening right off the bat, because a smile, he's got it up there and we're good. You're good? Yeah, we're good. Randall's going to do it. He's going to switch the screen right now. He says, a smile says somebody to somebody, you're welcome. Come in. The water's warm. That's your cue, Randall. The water's warm. There it is. <laughs> there it is. So, um, you know, when you hear that, you're like, yes. You know, you're at the ed pool, edge of a pool, and the first thing I'm thinking is it's, it's going to be freezing. But when somebody's standing out there saying, come on, the water's warm, and I trust them, uh, then I want to come on in. And that's what we're about today. We're about having the, the mindset of a welcoming person. Now, your attitude has a lot to do with the hopes that you place on a, on a relationship. Are you right? Am I right? Which is why um, the example that Lorene just gave us, that um, a son who was looking for an attitude of, of joy and happiness on the face of his mom and didn't see it, wondered how she was. Is she all right? He was checking on her heart, not on her face. Do you understand that? So out of the overflow of our heart, our face speaks as well as our words. So we're not talking about just turning up the edges of your lips. We're talking about turning up the light inside of you so that it becomes a welcoming place. Now, there are circumstances in which this is more difficult, sometimes on the way to church on Sunday morning with your children. Um, but here's a couple scenarios I want you to imagine. And I want you to show me with your face how you would feel in that circumstance. You're at the DMV. You're standing in line for three hours to get your license renewed. And when you reach the clerk, he tells you, sorry, you're in the wrong line. Here's another scenario. You are on your way to your class reunion. You haven't been home for a while, but you just lost your prize job for which you've become kind of famous back in your hometown. And you're carrying 20 extra pounds, and they're not in your suitcase. <laughs> and the first person you see is that skinny girl that married your boyfriend. You're smiling now, but I know you don't mean it if it were you. <laughs> Here's the last one. Your neighbor just called. She said she accidentally got your mail and opened it and said she's coming right over because you're going to like what's inside. And now this is a choose your ending scenario. Are you ready? What's inside are either a selection of third row seats to see Hamilton, a family pass to Disney World, or for Loreen and the rest of you, box seats to see the Cubs cinch the World Series. How do you feel then? How will you feel about greeting your neighbor at the door? What is likely to greet her other than just a hello? And it's going to be a smile. And that smile is going to be a response to your logical expectation that there is something good at the end of this encounter, correct? which is what we want to do on a basic introduction, of course. If you have a sour face, I might not even come over in the first place. But we're not just talking about the steps of a basic introduction. We're talking about when our own family is walking in the door, when we are getting in the car, getting ready for church, when we are coming up that long, windy driveway on the way into the building. Does our face express an attitude of hope and expectation? I'm going to challenge you, especially those of you who come to this church and at this campus, to make that long walk from the parking lot to the front door where the official greeter stands to make you an unofficial greeter, one who stops, looks, and sees who else is there and extends an attitude of welcome. Now, this weekend, I had an opportunity to practice just that thing. Um, you can go ahead and switch the next um, screen. Um, to stop and give us another click. This is the principle behind the habit. When we stop, 
we say, an effective friend makes another person her priority. This weekend, I stopped my agenda here at home, and I flew out to California where my sister lives, and um, I was invited to a bat mitzvah because her sister, uh, her child, my niece, is practicing Judaism. So I certainly stopped my regular agenda to do something quite different. And then the next habit, which is look. An effective, an effective friend makes another her priority. My sister, in addition to hosting myself, hosted 12 other family members, not all in her home, but all around town. She had to go to the airport. She had to make sure the sheets and beds were clean. She had to make sure the patio was swept off so that in between activities, we could have a comfortable place to be. And so I looked at what I could do for her, and I said, what can I do for you? And I did it. I made her my priority. Um, the last thing that um, an effective friend does is smile. And in this case, I'm going to use the term hope. An effective friend not only wants what's best for another, but demonstrates a hope in what's best for another. Now, this circumstance was unusual to me. I had not been to a bat mitzvah before. I had only been to a religious uh, service in the Jewish faith back when I was myself a child. I didn't have a lot of experience other than what I read in scripture, but I had this awesome expectation that what I was going to see there was going to amplify my own faith, and that what I was going to see there was going to show me that all the roots and foundations of Christ have been existence for all time and are being known by the chosen people of Israel. And I was going to see that. And so I was absolutely looking forward to the opportunity. And I was not disappointed. So here's what a bat mitzvah is for those of you who have not experienced. For a girl, it's called a bat mitzvah. And for a boy, it's called a bar mitzvah. And it is a service or um, an occasion marking the coming of age of a Jewish youth moving into, crossing the threshold into adulthood. Usually around the age of 13, there will be a ceremony at the temple or the synagogue, and it will mark the date. It's very significant, but it is preceded by a whole lot of study. For two years, my niece Ellen had been going to school to learn to read, write, and speak Hebrew. Now, mind you, Hebrew is written in different symbols than we read, and they are read from right to left, as is the book. You should have seen me in the pew trying to figure out how to open the book so the numbers move backwards. And here was Ellen, after a couple years of intensive study, reading Hebrew from the Hebrew symbols, from the Hebrew characters, from right to left in front of everybody, and pronouncing them with great um, expertise. And she read from um, the Torah, which she carefully, she learned to carefully handle behind a tabernacle. And the Torah is the first five books of the Bible that we share, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Torah, the law, the commandments and their exposition and their application. So she learned to read the Torah and to study various scholars' interpretation on uh, the, the um, edicts in there. The Talmud is um, the Jewish catechism, if you will. It is 6,200 pages of applications by serious scholars of the, um, the laws and trainings that are in the Torah. And in the Talmud contains um, the um, notion of bat or bar mitzvah, that someone will come of age by getting a certain level of understanding of the Torah. And Ellen indeed did. She not only had an understanding of the Torah, she sang it by memorized musical phrases for about an hour in a beautiful voice with clarity and with confidence uh, beside the rabbi and the cantor who are both clergy in that community. It was very beautiful. I liked it for so many reasons. And scholarship of the word of God is highly prized among the Jewish people. And I thought the whole time, I not only love this because I'm so proud of Ellen, my sweet niece, but within everything she's saying is a hope in the fulfillment of the words. She's studying the words on a page, and I'm studying the word of life, Jesus himself. I kept nudging both of my daughters on either side of me, and they love that. They love it when I nudge them during church. 
<laughs> they said, Mom, I know, I know, which was in and of itself a good thing. I'm not sure how many other people know because I didn't have big enough elbows to nudge everybody. <laughs> but it was, it was great. And what was really interesting is the rabbi, who herself was a, a very warm and engaging woman, was explaining all the parts of this and why they were significant. And she said that in this case, Ellen, whose bat mitzvah fell within a feast period and the feast of Sukkot, and you can give us a picture of that if you will, the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles or booths, was going on up until this past Sunday. That is a seven day uh, celebration in which the Jewish people remember and celebrate what God had done for them when they were escaping Egypt, Egypt across the Sinai Desert. And during this festival, um, there is a booth erected or a tabernacle or a sukkah or a sukkah, it's written several different ways, that is according to very specific uh, ordinances in Leviticus 23. You can read about them. You can read about the five feasts or the three feasts, depending on which portion you're reading of scripture. This is one of the feasts that Jesus would have absolutely celebrated during his lifetime. So if you want to know how Jesus did things, let's look back at his culture and see what he would have celebrated. And he would have celebrated this feast. In fact, many times in the New Testament where Jesus is named, where God is named in the person of Jesus, we see him going to and from festival time, to and from obligations in the, in the community of his faith. And this is one. During this feast, this booth would be erected in modern times as a remembrance of the shelters that were erected in the desert to protect the people and root. And they didn't have other materials, so they had to construct them out of whatever was in the desert, desert, sticks and certain branches and palm fronds and so forth. And so there are regulations as how to reenact that by constructing with certain building materials that are local to the area. But always the regulation is that you can have a Sukkot that covers you but not blocks your view of light, whether by sun or by moon, because the remembrances, God fed us, this is a harvest time celebration because of course now it's harvest time, God fed us and provided for us, gave us protection, but he always showed through. And in their story is this notion of impermanent house now for a permanence in the promised land. Do we know who that is? who invited us in to a castle that's waiting for us with rooms with our name on it, with permanence and protection forever. We know him in Jesus. They celebrate the impermanence in, in looking forward in hope and expectation to the permanence that we actually do know. It was very lovely. It was very lovely. When the service was complete, you know what we said to her? Mazel tov. Everybody say it. Mazel tov. You've seen Fiddler on the Roof. You can do better than that. Mazel tov which means basically good luck or here's hopes for your future. We, can, we roughly translate it congratulations, but it's more than that. In the same way we would say congratulations to a graduate, what we, don't, what we really mean is good luck in your future, correct? And that's what they're saying to this coming of age person. Good luck in your future. You have now been equipped to go well forward in your future. There is a hope and a promise awaiting you. The word bat mitzvah literally means bat, daughter, mitzvah of the commands or of the law, daughter of the law. She is now a daughter or he would be a son of the law. I think that's pretty cool. You ladies at some level, because you have your scriptures open on your lap and are, are consistently looking to find the word of God in them and apply it to your everyday life, you also are daughters of the law. Praise God. I'm going to talk today about a daughter of the law, or actually a daughter-in-law, a famous daughter-in-law that you know. Next slide. And her name is Ruth. And cool for us is that Ruth gets her own book of the Bible. She doesn't get a small mention like Martha and Mary, sometimes with not so good outcomes. She gets a whole book, and she is in the Old Testament. She also would be known by the Jewish people. Uh, this is the eighth book of the Old Testament. I would ask you to open your Bible to that book. So you have the Torah, the first five books, then you have Joshua and Judges, and it is followed by the book of Ruth. Now the book of Ruth is especially appropriate for us because it deals 100% with relationships. And the characters in the book of Ruth are all in relationship to one another. And we're going to study the behaviors of some of those characters. But what I want to remind you is that whenever we study scripture, 
We are not studying the characters in Scripture so that they'll be role models for us. We're studying the characters in Scripture because they're advancing and enlightening and illuminating our great role model, God himself. He puts the words on paper in human form so that we can put them into practical application for ourselves. We can say, oh, if Ruth can do it, if Naomi can do it, if David did it, if James does it, I can do it because we're made of flesh and blood in the very same way. But his goal is not for us to focus on any of those characters, but to focus on the character of himself, God himself, especially as it was made manifest in flesh by Jesus. But for the sake of our conversation today, we're going to focus on some of the behaviors that these women have exhibited, and we're going to find the good stuff in there. Now, I would love to read this all to you. It is four chapters, and you could read it today before you go to bed. It is very great reading, and I love it. But I'm going to kind of give you the Cliff's notes. I'm going to tell you, first of all, the characters are, um, uh, as I mentioned, Ruth, of course, uh, Naomi, who is her, her mother-in-law, who was widowed previously, um, the other daughter-in-law, whose name is Orpah, um, a man of high standing, a relative named Boaz, and various other small players like the girlfriends and the elders in the community. And the setting is first in Moab, which is an area outside of Israel, not among the chosen people. Moabites did not uh, have the same promise as the Israelites. And um, Elimelech, which is Naomi's husband, and herself and her two children have moved to Moab because there were hard times in Jerusalem, specifically in Bethlehem where they lived. And they've moved out of Bethlehem and into Moab. And during the time the boys have grown up, her husband has died. The boys have taken on husbands, uh, taken her sons as, no, the boys have taken on wives. And so because of that, um, Naomi still falls under the protection of a man. You understand, as we talked about before, that a woman without a husband or some kind of male um, overseer or keeper is at a very vulnerable position. So her sons have fulfilled that role until they also have died. And that this is where the story begins. In the time of the judges, it almost says once upon a time at the very first portion, we find these three women who have all been widowed. And as a result, they need to go seek protection. So Naomi takes her two daughters-in-law and they begin to head off toward back home for the homecoming in Bethlehem. And she gets just, just out the door and she realizes, she says to the girls, oh my goodness, girls, if you come with me, you're going to be without husbands. And they say, no, no, we love you. And they kissed her and they wept. No, we want to come with you. They clearly have a good relationship, which is precious to see. And she says, but even if I had, you know, a son now, got married myself and had sons, you wouldn't have time to marry them and, and, and be covered again. Obviously, in her mind, the solution to all of her problems is a man. And they say, oh, we, but we still want to come with you. But Orpah thinks, thinks, has a second thought about it and goes home to her mother and her people and her protection. But Ruth says these famous words that I know you've heard before. Perhaps you've heard them at a wedding because they are often repeated there. And she says, oh, let me find it. Where you will go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. She even says, let death not even separate us. This is a very sweet sign of her relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi. But not only is it a sweet sign of her relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi, it is a sweet sign of Naomi's faith being passed down even across another culture and another religion to a woman who has taken it up. Naomi has obviously been the kind of influence that would say to this young woman, I'm going to leave behind all of my ways and I'm going to follow all of your ways, including your God. This is a great picture of the kind of influence that we can have in and outside of our family relationships. Now, these two women are no longer related by law. There is no bridge in the sun. And now they have become two women sojourners, two girlfriends on the way. And they're heading back toward Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, Naomi's old friends at the class reunion, you know what they say to her? Can this be Naomi? Oh my gosh. And, and they, they scarcely recognize her. They certainly don't recognize her for being back where they are. And she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because I am bitter, and that's what Mara means. I am bitter, 
and the Lord Almighty has, has created this bitterness in me. This is a time where the Proverbs that says, um, hope deferred makes the heart sick becomes manifest. We see someone sick at heart, depressed with her circumstance. It's very logical. And you'll remember that in that, in that sense of depression, in that place where there is death and death and death and loss and change and transfer, what we do have in there is this hope of this one girlfriend, Ruth, who has said, I don't know what we're getting into, but I'm with you. But I'm with you. And in the way she shows this, they get into Bethlehem, and right away Ruth says, I have to provide for my mother-in-law Naomi, so I'm going to go into the fields, and I'm going to glean the leftover grain. In this culture, provision for the poor is laid out in that the edges of the field are not harvested. They are left for the poor, and anything that drops on the ground or is left behind by the harvesters is free for the picking. And so, in the town of their family, Ruth goes into a field and begins to glean from the field. And she finds out later that she happens to be in the field of a relative named Boaz. And he's not just any relative. He's a man of good standing. He has farms. He has property. But he also has what it looks to be great respect of the people in the village, especially his crew and his foreman. Because when he comes on to all the harvesters, the people that work for him, you know what he says to them? The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And you know what they reply? The Lord bless you. We see that there's an interchange here of faith and common standing, that there is a trust between the people. And Boaz, standing there looking out over the field, notices Ruth and says, now who's that? And mind you, Ruth has gone into the field earlier and said, I'm going to glean here with whomever I find favor. And she indeed finds favor from Boaz. And he looks over and sees Ruth gleaning, and he says, who's that girl, and what's her story? And the foremen catch him up to date. This is Naomi's daughter. She's preparing for her. She's providing for her. This is the long story. And he stands in admiration of that. And he invites her over. And he says, you stick with my people, because I've talked to them all, and they're going to protect you. No one's going to touch you or harm you. You stay with my girls. I'll make sure that you have water when you need it. And later on, even invites him to her table to to dine with him. And she goes back to her mother-in-law who says, how'd it go today? And she says, turns out I was in the field of Boaz, your relative. And Naomi's eyes perk up. And Mara is in the back seat at this point. She says, this is our kinsman redeemer. He is from our line. He has found favor with you. This is an amazing provision of God. And she says a blessing to him and a blessing about the circumstances. There are many blessings given in this uh, four um, chapters. And so Naomi continues with uh, the process of everyday gleaning and and providing for her mother-in-law. And then Naomi says, in one day, sometime after this first understanding, she tells Ruth to do something which sounds very strange to us. And that's to watch the harvesters, and after the day and the dinner is done, see where Boaz lies down, mark that spot, and after a while, when he's asleep, go lie down at his feet and uncover the feet and just lay there and wait. Now, I don't know about you, I love my mother-in-law, but that's strange. But at some level, this is a cultural experience that they would have understood, which we clearly have to stretch to understand. And what, what we're seeing here is uh, Ruth sitting at the feet of Boaz, in the same way we saw Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, getting his asking if she can get what he has. It's a, it's a kind of proposal. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and sees the woman and says, who are you? And she uh, reveals who she is. It's dark. And she says, um, if, uh, if you will, spread the corner of your garment over me. And he understands the metaphor. He understands she's at, he is being asked to spread himself, his name, his protection over her in a way. And he replies happily, The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than which you showed earlier. You didn't go after the young men, but me. So don't be afraid, and I'll do what you ask. Do you hear the hope? Do you hear the smile? Even if you couldn't see it because it's dark, you can certainly hear it in the intention. 
And she goes home and she tells Naomi. And Naomi goes, okay, now we wait. Now we wait. And at, in chapter 4, we find Boaz doing exactly as he says. He go to, goes to the town elders. He arranges for the legality of this, which there are some complications to. He clears them out of the way. He makes the deal. And then he announces, today you are my witnesses. I have bought Naomi and all the property of Elimelech and have acquired Ruth, Malon's widow, her son, as my own wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so the name will not disappear from among his family or from his own hometown. The culture here is, if your name is remembered, you are remembered. And without heirs or any lineage at all, the family of Elimelech would have been eradicated from memory. And this kinsman, family member, redeemer, has taken the name from the lost pile and put it into the found pile. He has redeemed the name of the family with this self-sacrificing action. I don't know. I see a relationship between the New Testament. And all of the elders reply this blessing as they've heard this. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. This is a good thing. You'll have to trust me on that. He's basically, they're basically saying, may your offspring make you famous in the same way that Je Judah was famous by his offspring. And so verse 413 4, says of Ruth, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son whom Naomi cared for. And Naomi's old high school friends got together and they blessed her and her redeemer with these words. Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he, the guardian redeemer, become famous throughout Israel he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. The name goes on. The name is redeemed. The Redeemer is to be praised. This is good stuff. And it comes to pass. So look at the uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. And you're going to see the lineage of the child of Boaz and Ruth. And you look all the way down at the bottom you'll see that the lineage ends in the king of Israel, King David. Very famous indeed. But that is not the end of the story. Flip over to Matthew 1. You're going to pick up the Ancestry.com list right there in Matthew 1. This is the part of the Bible when we open it and begin to read it, we skip it. It's got a bunch of names. And they're not there for no reason. Because as I told you, in the Jewish culture, to be named and to have heirs is to have lived, is to have had value. This is the value list. Now, look down at verse 5. We see Boaz's name in there. There he is again. And right under there, Boaz, the father of Obed, that's Ruth and Boaz's son, and there she is, whose mother was Ruth. She made the New Testament. And look all the way down at the bottom of that list, all those names, until the very last name on the list in verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. When that blessing was given to the Redeemer Boaz, that he was his name and his namesake and his heirs would be more famous in Israel than anyone else. We know that it came true. These were words of hope and expectation that came from an impermanent building to a permanent residence in the kingdom of heaven, and it's Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus says, like Naomi, we can have hope despite what look like insurmountable devastating, imperfect, not what we have chosen, circumstances. They can be overwhelmingly oppressive and bitter circumstances. But as believers in Jesus Christ, 
who, by virtue of our relationship with him, have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we can have a transformed mind. We can renew our mind and be transformed and transformative to others in a similar circumstances. That might be our not yet believing relatives. That might be a surly clerk at the driver's license bureau. That might be an old friend at our class reunion. Would we have that next picture, Randall? <laughs> There's our skinny girlfriend. And there we are with our 20 pound baggage. And what do her arms say? From lesson one, everybody put your arms out. There you are, there you are. That's how we breathe hope into what otherwise would be a bitter circumstance. And it is the essence of setting an expectation for a good relationship. I want you to listen to this song. I heard it uh, last week. And it is a song that reflects not only how we should see others, but how we indeed are seen by Jesus himself. So we'll just close with this song. May the Lord who loves you bless you and teach you and instruct you and transform you in the ways of his heart with hope and expectation for that which is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen.